So good morning, thank you all for being here. I'm gonna change speed a little bit. I'm gonna talk about um, meniscus transplantation and really my talk is uh, avoiding knee replacement or using, uh, while I do use replacement parts, I'm gonna talk about using biologic and non-metallic replacement parts so that you can avoid Dr. Cavanaugh and Dr. Ennis at least for a long period of time, uh, which I'm a big fan of. So understanding what I'm gonna talk about, first is to understand the meniscus and what the meniscus does. And there's, there's three concepts that I want you to understand. I want you to understand the meniscus cartilage, the articular cartilage, and the alignment. And Dr. Cavanaugh alluded to the alignment. First, the meniscus cartilage. These are these cartilage washers or cartilage discs that you can see on the right and the left here. And they're small shock absorbers. And what they do is as you take steps, it goes through your hip, through your knees, down to even Dr. Klein's ankles. Um, and these shock pads or shock absorbers help us out a lot. The second component is the articular or the gliding cartilage. And we often talk about a cartilage tear in our knee, but really need to distinguish between the articular or the gliding cartilage or the joint cartilage and the meniscal cartilage. So now we have two kinds of cartilage. And the third is the alignment of the knee, how bow-legged or how knock-kneed you are. There are some variants within humans that are, that are considered normal, but as you lose your liners or your joint liners or your meniscus, you can become more knock-kneed. Your alignment of the knee can change. And addressing the alignment is gonna be very important because as the knee alignment gets too close together, it becomes what I consider a hostile environment. It doesn't matter what meniscus, what cartilage or what tissue is in there. If the bone is too close to the bone, it's just gonna grind down whatever's in there. Here's an example of a healthy meniscus that I see at, at the time of surgery. I've got a probe on the meniscus and I'm pulling on it and you can see here that it's, it's nice and not torn. And in contrast, there's this flap, there's this tear here and that tear can cause catching and pain. Meniscus tears happen in many different ways and we treat them in a few different ways. Certainly, there's an acute tear in a young athlete who tears the whole meniscus away from its capsule and in that case, I'll make every effort to sew the meniscus back and to repair it. This is a complicated and hard rehabilitation. The vast majority of meniscal tears that we see in 40 and 50 and 60 year olds, however, are not of this variety. They're flap or radial tears like you can see in this image here. And this is really not amenable to sewing. Technically, we could accomplish sewing it back together again, but the chances of it healing are very, very small given the blood supply and the stresses that the meniscus is gonna see. So what we do here is after an appropriate course of non-operative treatment and working with therapy, sometimes an injection, I don't really know if there's a role for a PRP injection, in a flap tear of a meniscus, we bring these patients to surgery. And the vast majority will have this small hangnail or flap removed arthroscopically, get up, move around, and do very well from it. However, without that joint liner there, there are a subset of patients who are gonna slowly narrow that joint space down and over a period of time develop arthritic changes. Many of these people won't have any symptoms. However, if we monitor their joint, we'll see changes. Unfortunately, some of them are gonna go on to develop more and more symptoms, and we call this the post-menisectomy knee. When the joint space gets too narrowed down, or as the age advances, I unfortunately have to send them on for visco supplementation, for PRP, for physical therapy, for braces, and ultimately to see uh, the joint replacement surgeons. In contrast, when this happens in a 17-year-old, or a 20-year-old, or a 30-year-old, we get very worried. Instead of getting the, the, the changes of arthritis, they get pain and the pain in their knee related to the absence of a meniscus is a poor, poor prognosis and a harbinger of trouble to come. And while, while the joint replacement surgeons will fix you when your body needs fixing, I think there are times when we can do other surgeries, other interventions to limit and delay that until your 40s or 50s. Here we're looking at a patient who's had previous ACL surgery and at the time of their surgery had their meniscus removed given the severity of the tearing. And this is an unfortunate circumstance. We see meniscus tears in 66% of ACL tears. In this case, the pain grew larger and larger. The person couldn't return back to sports and the meniscus based on the MRI was absent. The alignment of the knee. This is going back to the alignment. Before a person gets too knock kneed, we can actually replace things inside the knee. When they get too knock kneed, it gets back to that hostile environment. We have to consider changing the alignment of the knee. And I'll talk about that and the solutions for that at the end of this talk. So here, we find indications and contraindications. And don't get too worked up on this slide. 
I think 15 or 20 years ago, when we talked about who can have a knee replacement and who can have a hip, hip replacement, you had to be 65, you had to have a certain body mass index, where there were a lot of criteria. And in keeping the criteria strict in whom we offer surgery to in the beginning, we can really figure out in whom it works best for and dial in the solutions for the patient, as opposed to just applying a technology to anyone who comes through the door. So we have strict reasons and strict indications on who's going to get this. We want compartmental pain, not diffuse pain. We want this person to be younger rather than older. And 50 is a number. It's a physiologic number. There are some 50-year-olds who really are not candidates for There are some 60-year-olds who look better than 25-year-olds. Um, we want that person to have normal ligaments before we give them a meniscus transplant, and we want their alignment to be normal so I don't try and put a meniscus into a hostile or imperfect environment. And what we do here um, is we send out to a bone bank as opposed to a kidney or a lung or an or organ donor bank. We measure the size of the patient. We have parameters to know exactly what we need. And we decide if it's the inside or medial or outside or lateral meniscus. And this can take a few months. So uh, patients are on call, so to speak, and they're not on call for a week or two weeks. It sometimes comes in 10 days, sometimes comes in 10 months. And we take this meniscus and we actually transplant it into the body. And, uh, and the issues with rejection are much, much less because the joint itself is not full of HLA receptors and immunosuppression is not, not an issue or requirement for this. So we can do this arthroscopically assisted or open. When we started doing these, it was a little more complicated. And this is getting done in the setting of an ACL and a medial medial um, collateral ligament reconstruction, really sort of complicated things. But the problem is that without filling the picture, without putting a meniscus in these 17, 25, and 30-year-old athletic or high-end laborers, you're going to end up in trouble. They're going to end up with a stable knee ligamentously, but a lot of arthritis in a short amount of time. So here is an example of the meniscus, and you can see the markings, the A and the P, that's anterior and posterior, because you imagine as you start to put this into the joint and you try and put this little uh, worm of tissue in the right place, it could wiggle around and get technically complicated and hard to do. Now, um, I think we've moved on as we've learned to understand and get these techniques better. We do them arthroscopically assisted, and the incisions are smaller, and it lo doesn't look more than an ACL uh, to you afterwards. And really, we have to use fresh tissue. We can't take a tissue that's been frozen or, or in the bank or stored for a long period of time. This is where this matching comes for. We use small bone plugs. So there's a lot of sculpting. There's actually the art of surgery and trying to dial this into the most right person and the exact indication here. And if we have to do concomitant procedures, such as adjusting the alignment or addressing the articular or the gliding cartilage, we like to do those all at the same time. At the back table here, I work on setting myself up, and this is a, an operation where I'm going to cut, get the condyle of bone and then sculpt out and remove. Here you see me removing the medial meniscus, and I'm going to create small little plugs of bone. And those plugs of bone are going to be the anchors that hold them in place. How do you get the meniscus? If the meniscus doesn't heal that well in the first place, how do I get a, an allograft or a dead one to heal in place? And that's by using small channels of bone and lots of stitches. And here you can see, again, this small little bone plug in the front and the back of the meniscus, the marking so that when I get it into the joint, I know exactly what alignment I want to put it in, and then stitches. And I'm going to stitch this into the, into the rim of the tissue. Arthroscopically, the instrumentation and the technology of medicine has been fantastic for us. We can really get things done a lot better, and they've made tools where we had an idea originally, but no tools to do it. Now we have tools to execute and articulate our specific ideas and subsets of ideas. And here you can see this small drill. These drills go in, and we put them together in the joint. It's like building a, um, a, a ship in a bottle, and we're able to accomplish these things. And here, if you see this slide play, you can see this small drill. I'm going to drill a tiny hole, and this is debris that will get cleaned out in a second. Uh, I'll move, this, I'll move these little, little holes. I don't need to open the knee up to create these small channels. And now I've created a socket. And I'm going to pull this meniscus and suck it into the back socket of the knee. And you can see that meniscus. And there's my purple mark on the meniscus letting me know my alignment's OK. I'm going to sew this in. And there's lots of technical features. And actually, uh, those of you who are interested can come to our lab and, uh, and learn and see how we do this when we teach other surgeons how to do these, uh, these reconstructions. Here's a second look. Here's a person who actually had the opportunity to come back for. Coming in a year later uh, in a, in a high-end athlete, come in and see this meniscus is healed back down into place. And what's even more remarkable, I, I think, to, the, uh, to those of you who look at cartilage a lot, the articular cartilage on that knee is pristine and perfect. So it is doing its job. It is protecting that cartilage. Uh, and it is delaying the inevitable wear of that knee. The second concept I'd mentioned is the articular or the gliding cartilage. So we've now sort of looked at the biologic or the non-replacement surgeon s s solutions rather to the um, to the 
meniscus. But the articular cartilage here, in this case, has had a trauma and a hole. is really a pothole, much akin to a pothole on the street. And this hole is going to cause the knee to wear out in a short amount of time. So again, going to the cadaveric, and it's kind of sad to think about these young, healthy donors donating their knees, but thank God they are because they're helping a lot of people. Um, here you can see a partial condylar knee, and again, I take a dowel or a cylinder of this bone, and I transplant this cartilage back into place. And here's a young man who had a traumatic ski injury. He, in an open fashion, had to have this condyle piece placed in. And if you look on this x-ray, you can see, actually you can't see, but incorporated in completely normally is this dowel of bone. Um, and this is about seven years ago, and he's doing fantastic. We don't have to do it in these big open ways anymore. We can do these arthroscopically now. And here you can see another example. And if you look carefully, hopefully in the back of the room it portrays well, these small dowels of bone have now been inserted into the knee in, a, uh, in an arthroscopic fashion. And this cartilage transplantation really does work and it works well and it lasts for a long time. The last component is the alignment, the knee knock kneedness or the bow leggedness. And if your knee meniscus is missing and the knee joint has gotten too close together, not too close that you've worn it out and need a knee replacement, but if it's gotten too close together where I can't do these things, we'll do what's called an osteotomy, a cutting of the leg. And Dr. Cavanaugh will remember this is a Coventry osteotomy. He did these when he was a resident and uh, when he was at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, they sort of fall, fell out of favor for a little bit. They're still probably much more popular in Europe. And in the 40 and 50 year old patient who wants to remain highly active, this is a reasonable operation. And now we've got it down to a very small, minimal incision. Here you can see an example of one right now. Um, and, and this is the way we, we let you walk faster on it. And really, I think this is a very significant advantage to knee replacement in the appropriate selected patients. Again, I can sort of talk about outcomes and strict indications. And the thing to take away from this is that these procedures, when done in the right patients, when selected carefully, work very well. They have the test of longevity. The U.S. Military Academy is an interesting place. If you can't perform, you have to go home. So my colleagues have studied meniscal allograft transplantation. And look, these are guys, these are, these are, are our armed forces who are going to get certain medical discharge. They underwent meniscal allograft transplantation, and this is a viable option for, in the military for getting these guys back on hard, high-end training and impact. So it does work. Um, tibial osteotomy in the right patient subsets does work. If you just use one solution and you use it for everybody, I think you can get into trouble. And that's what may earn certain operations an imperfect reputation when indeed uh, careful selection is the right answer. Transplantation, I think, is an accepted procedure. Arthroscopically, it is significantly less morbidity for the patients. It can be safe when we add in the concomitant articular cartilage transplantation or alignment procedures and osteotomies, and long-term results are getting there, and we're looking at 12 to 15 years of history on these at this point in time. Thank you very much.